But then we realized there are two, two possibilities that are actually are potentially of interest. As the plants right. reach microgravity, they feel like it's a stressful environment for them. So they try to adapt by turning some genes on, some other genes off. It's like they're trying to find a balance, right? Imagine that when all the lights start blinking and you start flipping switches, okay. trying to stop. And then when I'm actually ready to so turn that it on, the I just hit that button. Trying to adapt to the microgravity. Okay. Why is that important? Because since it's, those genes that are related to stress response, if you bring the plant back, now the plant is more adapted to stress because already triggers those genes their stress response. So the plants could adapt better on Earth in areas, especially facing uh, climate change. Yeah, or, that was going to be my question. Yeah, or, or drought or you know heat. So you will have plants that are more adapted. At the same time, when the plants adapt to microgravity, uh, they will be already adapted to that environment for long-term missions, like Mars. So you will have a plant that will be So it basically already. genetically alters yeah, but, them in a way. But naturally, yeah. not artificially. So. What, yeah. what happens to a plant in space It has a lot of geotropic? Well, yeah, plants respond uh, to gravity. Right, right? Yeah. Usually, you know, that's why you plant a seed, yeah. roots always roots down, and it yeah. shoots up. So well, it, it has to do with auxins also, and yeah. some other regulators. Yeah, exactly. But in space, they don't have that orientation. So they have done that in space. So if you put a seed, the root will start growing just, like just everywhere, crazy, and the yeah. shoots <laughs> off. So they get completely off. So. Yeah. But if you put them in a substrate, yeah, the roots tend to grow into the substrate and the shoots will still grow. Despite off. the gravity, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. They, ha they have a way to orient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, cool. yeah, there are a lot of studies with plants. And just recently, I was in a panel for NASA reviewing proposals. So, they're very interested in what they call life support systems, thinking about these long term missions yeah. and also the return to the moon because yeah. they're going back to the moon. So oh, yeah. they're thinking about establishing uh, a station on the moon and growing plants there, but also missions uh, mm -hmm. to Mars. So there are a lot of work done with vegetables or other crops, other uh, food crops that yeah. can be grown sustainably inside a, a rocket or a space station and maintain a good quality. Quality air and also produce. Yeah, food. quality air and quality nutrition. So plants that have a good source of nutrients for the astronauts. Fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work being done. Uh, when those plants adopted those new genes, are you growing that now with the new gene in it? Are you? No, the ones that we have, them? Yeah, the ones that we have, they came back, we actually planted some. There's some still in Homestead. Uh, they're doing fine, but just a few, because we end up losing a lot because of a hurricane. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> we were in Homestead, so there was a hurricane. Well, we lost actually a few in the field, and we lost some in the lab, because uh, we have a major power failure. Okay. We had generators, but the generators failed too. Oh, so the geez. plants that we had in culture, gone. Wow. So that was sad. And you know, you get a chance to send the plants up, bring them back. So if you lose them, to get another opportunity to fly, it's, yeah, it's kind of it's a pricey. Yeah. <laughs> have you guys merit cloned any of those? We we cloned some, but again, because they were in the in culture, we lost mm -hmm. them. Okay. Most of them. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, we still talk. We still talks with us. Uh, eventually, we may do some more experiments. Cool. Are the gene activation remaining when the plants return, or do they go back? That's that's a good question. Some genes revert back because now the plant's sensing that it's back, mm -hmm. but other genes remain active. Okay. For some reason, is that because the plant has the genes, mm -hmm. but those genes that are kind of dormant because yeah. under normal conditions. Mm -hmm. They don't need to trigger stress response genes. They are not under stress. But once they are submitted to stress, you know, those genes start they pop activated. on. So yeah. in certain cases, it's like basically those proteins continue being made. And when you bring it back, they still producing those proteins, okay. which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in terms of stress response. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. So yeah, there are some genes that revert back and others. And we're, we were interested in those that are maintained, that right. they do not revert back. Yeah. So. It's a good cool. question. <laughs> okay, ready to start? Yeah, we can start. Uh, so this is the group? All right, so it will be easier. Well, welcome and thanks for coming to this Thank you. tour. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my name is Wagner Van Drame. I'm professor and assistant department chair in environmental horticulture here at the University of Florida. And originally from Brazil, I got my uh, degree in Brazil from agricultural engineering and also my master in, in Brazil from plant physiology and biochemistry. And then my PhD in horticulture in Georgia. And I was working with the countries and then I worked with some forest trees. Then I was hired by UF to work mostly with ornamentals, which I had already some background. So I came here to work mostly on ornamental plant production and I used te two ba main techniques, uh, micropropagation and cryopreservation for production and conservation of plants. And working with me is my uh, scientific biologist, uh, David Velasquez, he uh, has a master's and what's your master's? My master's is ornamental horticulture. Okay. Uh, I got it at the University of Georgia as well. And I actually had a Dogs. A um, <laughs> undergraduate at Farmingdale State University, which is where the shirt is from, um, that was in ornamental horticulture as well. And, but I also had a background in micropropagation going back to that time, and so we do a lot of that. Yeah. Okay, so micropropagation basically, you know, think about micro and macro. Macro propagation, you already probably know includes, I mean, all sort of vegetative propagation. You can propagate plants, you know, the simplest way, by seeds, right? You get seeds, plant the seeds. But if you plant seeds, you're gonna have variability. So you want, if you want, if you have a plant that is really beautiful and you wanna clone that plant, you use vegetative propagation, usually cuttings, you can use grafting, there are different ways of propagating. But some plants do not propagate well by cuttings, the cuttings don't root. Uh, grafting is very difficult, labor intensive. So micropropagation is a way of cloning plants in the laboratory. It's, it's both uh, a science and an art <coughs> because it requires a lot of attention to detail, a lot of uh, fine handling of materials, tools, and plant materials. So <coughs> when you come to a plant tissue culture lab, we have like different areas that are specific for different functions. Usually it's a I would say sterile environment. I put in quotes because it's not completely sterile, but we try to maintain as clean as possible because the major uh, problem in tissue culture is contamination. Fungus, bacteria, and sometimes mites. So we try to keep the environment very clean. But when you come to a laboratory, you will find different areas. One area will be your uh, preparation area. Some labs will have a dirty lab says when you bring your first first plant material whatever it is and from that plant you're going to clean the plant and extract a piece of the plant that you're going to use for multiplication that piece is, is referred to as explant so the explant could be a piece of the leaf of the stem it could be a flower a flower bud a vegetative bud even roots pieces of roots but in order to put that in vitro, we first would need to wash, clean that very well, and once the material is clean, it's ready to go. But before that even, you need to prepare your culture medium. So you're familiar with substrates, right? You get your substrates to put your orchids in. So the culture medium is a substrate for the plants to grow. So basically we're mixing out the macro and micronutrients, so source of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, the micronutrients, copper, etc., and we mix them and we add agar. Agar is like you know a gelling agent. Think about Jello. You know, if you look at Jello, it's very similar, and that's to give support for the plants to grow. <clears throat> so we have now the culture medium. We have agar. Now we cannot just put the plants in there. We need to solidify the agar, and we need to sterilize because that agar is going to contain not only the nutrients but also sucrose. 
and that is perfect for growing all sort of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So we take it to an autoclave, which is another room, and that will sterilize the medium under high temperature and high pressure. Once the medium comes out, we take it to a clean room under a laminar flow hood, and you will see those here. And the laminar flow hood has a HEPA filter, which is a high efficient particle air, uh, which is a big filter that filters spores of fungi, bacteria, and even some viruses. So, and the air is always blowing towards you. So that environment, that kind of area is very clean. So it allows you to do transfers with minimum contamination. I, I'm not gonna say without contamination, because sometimes it happens. How many microns down does it filter out? Do you remember? I don't know. Do you know how many microns the HEPA filter? Is point two around or lower. Oh, yeah. that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it is. They're very, very, very good filters. And we keep them, if you hear the noise in the background, mm -hmm. we keep them running 24 7 because, you know, so the air is always clean. And I'll explain exactly how they work. So, in the laminar flow hood, that's when we do our transfers. We cut our tissue, we do some extra steps for disinfestation of the tissue. And then we cut them, prepare them, and put them in the culture medium, seal, and then we go to another room, which is the growth room. And that's when the plants are going to grow. And that growth room has controlled temperature, a light for the period. Sometimes you can have humidity also, control. So you're going to see all of that. So in order to start, I'm going to start with the first room, which is the media preparation room, is where we prepare all the things. Uh, we can all fit there probably, but uh, you know, as I talk, you, you can take uh, turns to look at the equipment that we use. Okay, yeah. so mm -hmm. let's start here. Like this, so it won't lock. So, come in. So the media preparation room, actually I have a, I don't know if I can share there via web, but I developed a virtual tour, which is a 360 tour that you can look at this lab and you can click on different equipment and see what it does. Mm. Uh, I, I teach micropropagation, which is starts now the fall. It's a full semester course live with lectures and lab sessions. But, uh, Okay, media preparation. In those cabinets, we have all the uh, powder nutrients and, and vitamins and plant growth regulators that we need to use for the media. So we use these uh, beakers. We have glass beakers, but the metals work really well. But basically what we do, we put some distilled water. Oh, water quality is very important also. So we have distilled, deionized water, and sometimes we even sterilize water in the autoclave. So we put some water, we have your nutrients, uh, we use the steering plates, uh, we have the steering bars, so they're constantly steering and mixing everything. And once we have all the nutrients, we get a graduated cylinder, some of those in the racks there, and we complete the volume, whether it is one liter, two liters, and then we have our medium ready. Then we can dispense in a flask, then we measure the agar, which is gonna be the gelling agent, we add to the medium and we take to the autoclave. In the autoclave, we sterilize everything. So from the autoclave, we take to the laminar flow hood for doing the dispensing of the medium and then later the transfer. So in a, in a lab like this, what you will find, of course, a lot of uh, glassware, the steering plates is for mixing, a pH meter, which is the measures the pH of the medium, 
usually most of the cultures that we use, the plants, the pH is between 5.6, 5.8. Some cultures are a little lower, some a little higher. But it's usually in the range, I would say, 4 to 6, uh, mostly. And, uh, and we can adjust the pH as we mix everything. We either, either add an acid or a base. An acid to lower the pH, a base to increase the pH to reach the level that we want. We have analytical scales on this uh, side, some with different levels of sensitivity, so we can measure very, very tiny amounts to micrograms, uh, others to grams. And we also have some machines that dispense the medium. If you have a lot of uh, things to dispense, we can use these machines that will, you just press and they will dispense a certain volume, fixed volume to each flask. And that facilitates uh, the process. <coughs> so, let me see what else. David? Yes, you are here? Yes. Am I missing anything? Um, not particularly. We have the stock solutions in the refrigerator in the yeah. corner over here. Yeah, the other thing is that a lot of this mixing takes time, so let's say micronutrients, which we use a lot, or micronutrients or vitamins, sometimes we just pre-mix them and we make them concentrated, 10x or 100x or 1000x, and we mix them and keep them in the refrigerator. Then when you need to prepare your medium, you just take a small amount, you know, 10 milliliters, 1 milliliter, and add and that's already there, so you don't need to keep adding everything and mixing it. So that facilitates also the process. I have a question. Is the media always acidic, regardless of the type of plant you're going to grow? Um, most of the plants, actually even greenhouse plants, they tend to be, I think, in the range of 5.8, 5.7. So most of the plants that we grow are, are in that range. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's slightly acidic. But I don't know, David, have we worked with any plants that are higher? Never anything that is above neutral, really. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. when I played around with, like, plants that would normally like saline things, like cacti, we still tend to keep them acidic anyway. Um, the agar might not solidify if it were yeah. too basic. Mm -hmm. and, and the um, plants can't make use of the nutrients because yeah. the plants need things in the form of ions yeah. to absorb them. That's a good point. There is a chart that usually I show my students which shows the uh, range of nutrient availability uh, according to the pH and for each nutrient. So you have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and everything in the list. So the graph shows when the uh, nutrient availability increases and then decreases. So you know the exact range where the nutrient will be available to your plants. So if you go too low or too high, that availability reduces. Also, there are interactions between nutrients. Yeah, usually uh, we see sometimes that a student may make a mistake and when, you know, he pours the medium and everything, a couple of days later, the medium is too liquid, it's not solidified. So that tells us that he probably messed up the pH. And, uh, now, on this side, let, let me move here. We haven't done much on this, but we have some equipment here that we can use for uh, molecular biology. Nice. So some micro centrifuge. This is refrigerated. This is just a regular one. We have another drop, the, this small machine.